How many of you came back to business school so you could get a better job and a higher paycheck? How many of you thought about what would happen if that plan didn't work out? Well, it didn't for me. And last, Sharon emailed me a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, will you come talk to these guys about what you have been up to? And my first reaction was, hell yes, I'll come and talk to them because they really, really need to hear what I have to say and this is really important. And then I sort of sat with that for a couple of weeks and I remembered something, that your ego is a really interesting animal in that it needs to be fed in order to remain healthy, but when you overfeed it, it kind of pukes all over your life and makes you look like a complete jackass. So I'm not here to tell you what to do with your life or your career or any of those things, just to share some things that I've learned from mine. And the first lesson I can share with you is that nothing in life is a one-size-fits-all solution. So take what you can from my speech, whether it applies to you or not, see what's useful and apply it to your life. Uh, as Sharon mentioned, I was a student here in 2007 and I started college, uh, I think, in 1996. When I was in college, companies like eBay were going public and I was sitting in the movie theater with my friends watching the movie Office Space, all of us just laughing at how ridiculous this work environment seemed. And then the following summer, we all went and got jobs at cubicle farms in Silicon Valley. And we did it again the next summer. And then when we graduated, we kept looking for jobs like this. And I could never figure out how many tennis balls fit in a room or how, many, how much a 747 weighs, which are apparently <laughs> prerequisites for a career in investment banking or management consulting. So I figured I'm going to go and find a career in sales because at least that way I'll never have to go to an office. In case you haven't gathered from the title of my talk, I've never been particularly good at being an employee. Uh, I don't enjoy being an employee. I have issues with authority, which anybody in the administrative staff here at Pepperdine will validate for you. Uh, but what that led to was my very first job, working in sales for a software company. And it turns out that when you work in sales for a software company, you work in inside sales. So that then I did have to go to an office. And I sat around and I made cold calls all day long. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that my first company made the place on office space look like a fantastic place to work. And five days before Christmas, I got fired for my very first job out of college. And I spent the next probably six to seven years repeating this pattern over and over again, of going to a job I hated, leaving before I could get fired, until finally I realized that I needed to escape this hell that I'd created for myself. And in a moment of either temporary insanity or youthful indiscretion, I applied to business school. And that brought me here. And I had this really grand plan for what I was going to do with my life when I got to business school. I would work really hard, I would pursue the best possible job opportunities, I'd get out of sales and I'd get my $90,000 a year job at some really big company. And this plan was going really well, actually it went fantastic until the end of my summer internship. As Sharon mentioned, I was an intern with Intuit's TurboTax group. Uh, I was their social media intern and I got paid really well, I got paid $7,000 a month my summer internship. And at the end of that summer internship, my boss called me to his office and said, well, we've decided that we're not going to be making you an offer. And considering I don't particularly enjoy paying taxes, I figure working on them, not working on them for a living is probably a blessing in disguise. Just to be clear, I'm not advocating tax evasion. <laughs> but that moment was really sort of a, a turning point in my life. And what I realized is that living your life according to some predefined formula isn't a guarantee of success. And throughout school, and this is probably something many of you have experienced, you've been taught that, hey, do this and you'll get this. Do this and you'll get this. Get straight A's and you'll get into a good grad school. Do really well at school and you'll get a great job. Well, all of those plans didn't work out for me. And I was really disillusioned. And then the financial crisis of 2008 happened. And I got into school in April 2009. And I didn't have a job offer. There probably wasn't a worse time you could have graduated from business school. I was 32 years old, I ran completely out of money, and I moved back to my parents' house. And I was forced to face a very harsh reality and something that I think is more true today than it was when I graduated. And the other Dan Pink says that MBAs are becoming today's blue collar worker. And the reason for that is that the degree in and of itself is a commodity now. Simply having the degree is no longer enough to get you a job. If all you're doing is going to class, and doing what's required of you, even if you're getting straight A's, you're gonna be really, really disillusioned when you get out and you're gonna get a rude awakening, because I sure as hell did. 
So I started looking at what was going on in the market, and I saw that people were finding these really creative ways to find jobs. Uh, there was this girl who had started this website called twittershouldhireme.com, and it ended up getting all this national media attention. She not only got job offers from Twitter and a bunch of other companies, she ended up going on to do her own thing. And I thought, well, how hard could this be? I can do this. So I started this really stupid website called 100reasonyoushouldhireme.com. And really all it was was 100 of the bullet points on my resume and blog form. And I got hate mail from people I had never met and even classmates of mine who weren't friends. But it ignited my curiosity about this process. I thought, okay, well, I screwed it up royally. But if I did this the right way, what would actually happen? And people will often ask me nowadays, especially when they're considering grad school, what has the MBA done for you? And I always tell them, I said, the MBA has done two things for me. It gave me a really nice piece of paper that hangs on the wall at my parents' house in a really nice frame. And every month, a bill shows up. And no matter how many times I've called the lender and said, you know what, there's thousands of people with the name Srinivas Rao in South India. Are you sure you have the right one? <laughs> they still send the bill to me. <laughs> so it really, really opened my eyes to the fact that we live in a really kind of odd world today. And my resume was completely useless. Uh, despite all this work experience, I mean, I've worked at places like Intuit, Forrester Research, Nielsen, and I realized that I didn't know how to do anything. I said, you know, I had all these bullet points and I thought, wow, no wonder nobody's going to hire me. I couldn't even come up with a hundred reasons that somebody should hire me. That's one of the major reasons that project stopped. But what that began uh, was this sort of desire to find out how do you stand out in a crowd? Because there was no way that I was going to get a job by submitting resumes endlessly. I, on average at that time, and I don't imagine that this has changed, I had a friend who told me that recruiters will get about a thousand resumes for one position. And because that number is so high, they'll even just take the first 500 off and throw them out so they don't have to sort through them. So you're literally just blasting stuff into a black hole. And what that began for me is a journey for, that I refer to affectionately as one made up of waves and words. Uh, despite what anybody tells you, when you're going through an extended period of unemployment, the worst possible thing you can do with your time is to spend all of it looking for a job. Because it's depressing, it's demoralizing, it's just a constant reminder on a daily basis that you're not where you want to be with your life. So I recommend finding something to get you through those periods. For me, that thing happened to be surfing, and any of you here in school just be warned that it might cause you to quit graduate school if you start surfing. <laughs> God knows I probably wouldn't have finished. But I realized it was the perfect sport for the unemployed because it took up a shitload of time and it didn't cost any money. And along with that, uh, I started my very first blog, as Sharon has mentioned. And that blog is called The School of Life. And it opened up a lot of doors. Things started to happen that I never really planned for. I mean, the only reason I started the blog was to have a way to stand out in the job market. And it eventually led to my very first day job as the head of social media for an online travel company. It's led to opportunities to speak at conferences. Uh, in addition, I started a show called Blogcast FM, which Sharon said is, is kind of like the Oprah of the blogosphere, where I've interviewed about 300 New York Times, like 300 best-selling authors, entrepreneurs, and bloggers. But more than any of those things, what it's done is it's connected me to some of the most amazing and interesting people I've ever met in my life. And I'll share one example with you because I think it's, it's the perfect example. Uh, I have a, had a guy who was a guest on my show who has a site called Fluent in Three Months. And the premise of the site is that he moves to a different country every three months and he becomes fluent in the local language within three months. And he's created courses around how he does it. So imagine this is one guy with a website the ability to write, and some tenacity, and he's competing with things like Rosetta Stone and Pimsleur, which are big corporations. So what that made me realize is that if a platform can open all these doors, it's that the opportunity for self-expression is greater and more important than it's been at any time. How many of you, if you had to dig a swimming pool, and I gave you a tractor and a plastic spoon, would use the plastic spoon? Good, thank God. Okay, so the point that I'm trying to make is that you have access to all these tools and technology, and limiting yourself to something like a resume really limits your options. And I mean, why would you want to be hired based on a bunch of bullets on a page anyways, when you can use all this technology to express who you are as a person, 
And the kinds of opportunities that come your way based on that are really different. They're much more aligned with your values as opposed to, hey, this looks good on paper and the bullet points match up. And I'm not talking about starting the next Facebook or the next Twitter. People are starting businesses with as little as $100 these days. And there's a great book you guys should read called The $100 Startup, written by a guy named Chris Gilbo. Uh, and in that book, he actually documents several examples of this. And his story is that he was on a mission to visit every country in the world before he turned 35. And he'll be done this year. So, you know, and so what all this means for you uh, is that there's a lot of power in having a platform of some sort. How many of you have you had the opportunity to be on the Jay Leno show or to be on Oprah to talk about what you want to do with your life or career would jump at that opportunity? <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so the thing is you don't need to be on the Oprah show or Jay Leno show because what has happened with technology is the gap between creativity and technology is narrower than it's ever been. I mean, we could film a video right here, right now, and you could broadcast it to the world. And when you start to do that with an actual purpose, hell, you can do it without a purpose. Just go look at half the stuff on YouTube that gets millions of views. But when you start to do that with a purpose and an end in mind, that's incredibly powerful. It can lead you to a lot of things. It can lead you to job opportunities. I've had opportunities to be on panels. Just when I checked my email today, I had been written by an editor of a really popular blog asking if I would be willing to contribute to their blog. Uh, I'm talking to a literary agent about potentially writing a book. None of this stuff was all part of my plan. I thought I was going to have a nice job at a desk uh, collecting my $90,000 paycheck, and obviously that plan went to hell. Uh, but more important than any of this, what having a platform will do is it will give you access to people. All the technology that we have at our disposal today has connected us in a way that we've never been connected before. And if you limit yourself to being connected to the people in this room or the people on this campus, you're limiting yourself to a very small bubble when you don't need to. And why would you do that? And if you don't think it's important to be connected to people, I think the founder of LinkedIn had a really profound quote in his recent book when he said that golden opportunities are not wrapped in pretty packages with clear labels. The day and age of blasting resumes onto mainstream job boards is going to come to an end. In fact, I think it's quickly coming to an end. In fact, what I say is that these mainstream job boards are like sewage systems of people flushing their resumes down the toilet. And do you really want to compete among this sea of garbage when you don't have to? Uh, it's just, I think you're, you're spinning your wheels unnecessarily. Now, when a lot of you told me you were first year students, I was really happy to hear that. Because I made the mistake of not getting started on any of this in 2008, and there were a lot less people doing it then. What you have at your disposal when you're in school is time and the fact that you don't need to make money right now. That gives you a lot of leverage to screw up and to try things that you may not even realize you have. Uh, and if you don't think this matters, think about doing something every single day over the course of the next two years. And think about how much progress you've made by the time you're done with that. It, it's amazing. People write books. I mean, if you, if you think about a book, right? A book is about 300 pages on average. You're going to be here for about 300 days. You could literally write a book by the time you graduate from there. So when Sharon emailed me, she said to talk to you guys about how to do this. And I think that's a little bit beyond the scope of our, for our conversation today, because there's a lot that goes into the actual uh, tactical parts of this. But what I always tell people is to just take the first step. That might be buying a domain name. That might be picking up a book about the subject. Because when you take the first step, the view will change. I always say it's kind of like standing in two different spots in the same room. When you stand in one spot and you move to another, the perspective changes. All of a sudden, you have new information to act on. So you can plan until you're blue in the face, but you're not going to really know what that next step is until you take the first one. So what that means for you guys is start a channel of some sort. Start a blog. Start a podcast. Start a YouTube channel. Like I said, you could literally start recording videos today and broadcasting them to your friends. One of the things that I see as a highly underutilized opportunity here at school is to create media around what goes on on this campus. And for those of you guys who don't know my friend Douglas Gore, he's the director of PR here at Pepperdine, and he's been pushing very hard to get students involved. That's a platform that's already built for you. What you do with it is up to you. I mean, if you're thinking about working in the entertainment industry, why not create a show about what goes on here at school instead of you know, telling people that, hey, I have all these things on my resume, tangible evidence is a lot more valuable. Now, 
I could give you a recipe and I could give you all the ingredients, but until you get in the kitchen, you're not going to know how to cook. And even then, you're still going to have to learn how to cook. Trial and error is an inevitable part of this process. As I mentioned to you, uh, I started that one stupid site, the 100 Reasons You Should Hire Me site, but I hadn't mentioned that there are a lot of other failures that have come before this. And I still screw up. On a daily basis, there are things that I do completely wrong. But I've learned how to move past those things. Because if you are comfortable with making mistakes and moving past them and learning from them, you'll make tremendous progress really, really fast. What I didn't tell you is a few months ago, I decided to add up how long I'd been at all of this. And there are only two things in my life that I've done for over a 1,000 days. And neither of them are staying at a job. Uh, one is surfing, and the other is all these online projects that I've worked on. And strangely enough, in the last month or two, a lot of opportunities have started to come my way. Speaking opportunities, uh, conversations with literary agents, all that has happened in the last three to six months, and, and a lot of it in the last month. And when you look at a thousand days, you might think, well, that's a hell of a lot of time to put into something. But you're going to be here for about 600 days. Most of you have done something in your life for a thousand days already. You went to college. Some of you probably watched your favorite TV show for a thousand days. Not exactly the best use of time in my opinion, but you've done that. I've done it too. Mine happens to be the OC. I have the pop culture taste of a teenage girl. Um, but the thing is, when you look at it, a thousand days in the span of a lifetime is a small price to pay for doing work that's really fulfilling. So as I mentioned to you, when I talk about my MBA, I always say that uh, I, all I got was a piece of paper for it. But interestingly enough, in school I got a degree and in life I'm getting an education. One that I could have never predicted would be what it is. And I want to share some final lessons with you that I've learned just going through this entire journey. You know, life is, is not linear, even though school might have you believe that, because school is incredibly linear. <laughs> My entire plan for what I thought my life was going to be completely fell apart when the financial crisis hit. And there's not a day that goes by that I'm not grateful for the fact that I didn't have a job when I got out of here, because I got to surf for six hours a day for eight months straight. Uh, there's not a day that I'm not grateful for the fact that, or the, the fact that my boss at Intuit decided not to hire me. And in all the conversations I've had with people who've become best-selling authors, people who've become successful entrepreneurs, what I realized is that straight and narrow paths rarely lead to interesting destinations. In fact, if you look at the career trajectories of the most successful people in the world, they're almost never linear. Something completely derails plans. I mean, there are rare exceptions, but for the most part, it's not a linear path. In fact, somebody was passing around this uh, graphic on Facebook. They're like, this is what people think success looks like, and this is what it actually looks like until it comes out the end. I mean, all these stories you hear about the Zuckerbergs of the world, the uh, Instagrams of the world, you don't hear the other part of that story ever because that doesn't sell newspapers and it doesn't sell books. But there's a really ugly story that comes before all that. Something to think about as you go out and sort of look at what your career options are. As I mentioned, I was a Berkeley undergrad, so as you can imagine, I have some pretty smart friends who are definitely not underachievers. Most of my friends went to school at places like Harvard, Wharton, or Stanford for business school. If they didn't, they were engineers and went to work at places like Google and Microsoft. And when they finished undergrad, a lot of them had jobs at places like Bain, McKinsey, and Goldman Sachs. And for a long time, I thought that I was lacking something because I never fit the bill. Like I, I could never get any of these things on my resume. And as a result, every time I had an opportunity to change careers or to change jobs, every decision I made was based on what the book got on paper. And I realized that was largely a function of my ego. And how I came to this realization was that I was out here in Malibu with a friend of mine surfing, and he is also an alumni of this program. He said, you know what, I just want a job that looks good on paper. And it, it was a Tuesday afternoon, and I thought, well, I have a job that doesn't look good on paper, and I'm here surfing with you on a Tuesday afternoon. And what that made me realize is that there's a big difference between a life that looks good on paper and one that actually is. So most of what I am telling you flies in the face of conventional wisdom. And I, I strongly believe that conventional wisdom will produce conventional results. There's no question that it works. Uh, obviously, to some degree, it's been effective. That's why it's been passed on so much. But 
if you want to experience things in your life that you've never experienced, then you've got to be willing to do things you've never done and try things that you've never tried because that's what opens up possibilities in your life. And I'll finish with something that has been on my mind a lot lately. I think we're, we're really, really optimistic and, and starry-eyed and dreamy as kids. And as we go through school, as we get impacted by our peers, people start telling us to be realistic, be practical. I mean, I get that. You have to pay bills. You have to take care of things. And it's scary to go off the beaten path and do things. I mean, every day I'm kind of like, what's wrong with me? Why would anybody do this to themselves? But on the flip side of that, I realize that I'm getting to do something that I would have never done had I just stayed on the traditional path. And there's an article that gets passed around on Facebook. For some reason, people seem to be going through a time of finding themselves. And it's about the top five regrets of the dying. And it shows up on my feed every few weeks, because I think every few weeks, one of my friends must be going through some sort of an awakening. Either that or they're all getting high. Uh, <laughs> but I look at that article every time it comes up. And I want to leave you guys with one message. One is to look at that article. And if you feel like you're headed in a path that is going to cause you to have any of those regrets, then alter your course and do something different. What do you think of Srini's speech? Uh, Srini's speech was incredible. I felt like it, it blew every single thing that we've learned from career services out of the water. So everything that we learned here was 20 times more valuable than anything that I've gotten so far. I yet to see what they have to pull out of their hats, but everything he said was completely valuable and valid and very inspirational.